In 2018, one of the donations I received was a Heroid. This was donated by Benny Cash, and this is basically a slight variation on the Tommy Omnibot, which is also related to the Radio Shack Roby Sr. One problem, however, is that it did not come with a remote control, which is sort of important for this unit. Originally, I declined to accept the donation because it didn't have the remote. However, about a week later, I got an email from an entirely different person saying that they had found a spare remote for this exact unit. So I emailed Benny back and I'm like, well, hey, I found a remote for this so you can go ahead and send it. And he did. Unfortunately, the guy with the remote was a no-show. The remote never showed up and um, I never heard back from him. As such, the Heroid just sat in the corner of my office collecting dust for two years because I just didn't know what to do with it. It needed extensive restoration work, but I wasn't sure how to repair it and I still didn't have a remote. But then I got an email from Randy Rain, who is an avid collector of these sorts of robots and also has extensive experience repairing them. By sheer coincidence, she also lives in the Fort Worth area and so I invited her over to take a look at my Heroid. She had a look at it and seemed to think it would be a project that she could handle. It was covered in dust from two years of sitting. Randy took the Heroid home with her and began to examine it. To test it, she put a new battery in there. These things actually run on a 6 volt sealed lead acid battery. It actually did power on, but wouldn't really do anything without the remote. Unfortunately, it turns out the remote from the Omnibot and the Radio Shack units wouldn't work. Also, the clock has its own battery cells and the terminals were all corroded. So it was time to disassemble the thing and one thing that became immediately obvious was that it was full of dirt. As she opened bits of it, dirt ended up all over her workbench. And in order to open it up, there are several screws on the bottom that needed to come out, but every single one of them had a problem. There were dirt dauber nests inside every single hole. As she tried picking some of it out with a screwdriver, um, ultimately used WD-40 to rinse some of it out. This worked for all of the screw holes except one. Now, this one was so corroded that there was just nothing left of the head, so she had to drill through the screw to get it off. Of course, that helped get the unit apart, but then the rest of the screw was still stuck in the plastic, so this presented a real problem, but uh, she eventually prevailed. The bottom section of the Heroid contains the drive unit, which you can see here, and it was going to need a little work, especially lubrication. And these axle shafts were uh, also very corroded, and that will be dealt with shortly. But for the moment, here's the inside of the gearbox. And you can see these motors are pretty small and go through some serious reduction gears for the final drive. Uh, she went ahead and pulled out all these so they could be cleaned, inspected, and lubricated. The motors themselves uh, seem to be seized up, which is not surprising for their age and having sat so long. So she was able to spray some WD-40 inside and managed to get them spinning again. In fact, here's a quick test of the motors by powering them directly. She soaked the axles in CLR for a while to help clear off the corrosion. While waiting on that, she went ahead and started to disassemble the body of the Heroid, and what a lovely mess of cobwebs and gnats were <laughs> waiting inside. Fortunately, the circuit boards appeared to be in decent condition. She used a hairdryer to pull off the decals since half of them were falling apart or falling off anyway. The cassette recorder is located inside this little blue box, and it too was full of dirt dauber nests and the screw holes. Uh, she did eventually get it open, and it did require a new belt, which she had on hand. Randy managed to find another broken Heroid, and believe it or not, in worse shape than mine was. But at least it did come with a remote, but the remote was itself quite a challenge. It was yellow, the battery contacts were all corroded, and it was missing the battery door. So she went ahead and disassembled it, which did require desoldering the battery terminals, and then she also removed the decals from the top with a hairdryer. She also popped out all the terminals so they could be cleaned. At this point, there was just a lot of extra disassembly to do. So Randy returned the case parts to me for retro writing, but before I could begin on that, I had to take care of something else. Now while these parts are clean, they do seem to have like a lot of scuffs and black marks and stuff on them, which I just don't like retro writing stuff like that. You can see some of these pieces are just covered in black marks, and I was pretty sure alcohol and some elbow grease would clean this off, so I got to work.
Next it was time to retrobrite, but as always it seems the weather was not going to cooperate. Plus there was another problem. Um, this was right at the beginning of the pandemic and thus all of the store shelves were completely empty of paper products. I drove all around town trying to find some extra paper towels and finally found some. I set up a makeshift retrobrite contraption in my studio and I just put all of the pieces in one crate and filled it up with water. Unfortunately I did run into a bit of a problem I didn't anticipate. I couldn't fill the crate up quite as far as I had planned because I didn't realize or notice that near the handles there were these holes in the side. Uh, thus that became the limit for filling it up which was just barely enough. Fortunately I still had some volume 40 clear liquid in the closet since all the salon supply stores were closed due to the pandemic. And here we go, time to fire up the UV lights. I wasn't sure how long this would take since the last thing I did like this was really fast, but I also knew the vast amount of water here would be diluting the peroxide. I checked back after a couple hours and found bubbles all over everything, which is a good sign that it's working. Unfortunately, many of the smaller pieces were indeed floating to the top, so I knew I'd have to check on this regularly to keep it under control. Usually I can just shake the various pieces to get the bubbles off. Anyway, it looked like uh, most of the pieces were done, so I decided to empty the bucket by siphoning the water into the bathtub like so. The bucket was much too heavy to move without spilling the water everywhere, so this seemed like the easiest solution. It took about 10 minutes to empty most of the water out. So how did it turn out? Well, all the pieces look better, but uh, some of them are still yellow. So here are two identical pieces, but clearly one side of this robot was more yellow than the other. And uh, this headpiece here definitely needs some more work. And this remote control is the worst. So I decided to use a smaller bucket and work on some of the stubborn pieces that needed extra time. Now one problem was I was completely out of the clear 40 volume liquid, but I did still have some sodium percarbonate left over from the experiment I did before. Now this stuff works just fine for retrobriting. The only reason I don't use it more often is because it makes the water corrosive to metals. Fortunately I don't have anything metal in this particular tub, so it should be fine. So uh, we'll give this a few hours and come back and check on it. And here we are. It took almost two days additional time to get these results. I mean, this piece here was nearly brown when we started, but uh, I'll admit the results aren't perfect. For example, on this remote you can still see a contrast between the exposed and non-exposed areas. I could probably work on another few days to get it perfect, but I think it's good enough for now. I returned all of the parts to Randy, and one problem that was going to have to be dealt with was these broken tie rods for the arms. All four of them were broken on this thing. Um, Randy is gluing this one back together with super glue, but probably not for the reason you're thinking. Super glue is simply not strong enough to hold something like this. Instead, she's going to mold new ones from this old one. She starts by gluing it down to a platform here. Then she builds up what's called a dam around the object. Once that's done, she pours in a silicone product, which uh, will form around the plastic, creating the mold. In order to help get out any air bubbles from the silicone, she puts it in a vacuum chamber and sucks out all of the air. This caused the silicone to settle like this, so the solution is to add more silicone. And of course, put it back in the vacuum chamber again. At this point the silicone should be cured, so it's time to take it out. She'll make a clean incision right down the center and attempt to remove the original tie rod. As you can see, the super glue already broke just trying to remove the tie rod from the mold. The next step is to prepare the urethane, which will form the new part. She adds in some tint to give it a color that will hopefully match the rest of the robot. Then the mold is placed in a pressure cooker and the urethane is poured into a cask. She uses a hose with compressed air to pressurize the container. This is exactly opposite of the vacuum chamber used on the silicone mold, yet its purpose is exactly the same, which is to remove any bubbles from the final product before it cures. After sufficient time passes, the pressure is released from the container, and then of course she removes the new part from the mold, being careful not to damage the mold since she'll need to use it again since she needs to make four of these parts. In fact, you can see she's already made one, and this is the second one. At this point, there's some reassembly to do. As for the face, one big problem was the cracked plastic on the previous unit, and she ended up salvaging the front face cover from the other heroid that she'd found. As for those decals she removed, she printed some on her inkjet printer. Normally she would have gone down to Staples or someplace like that to get higher quality prints done, but since this was the middle of the pandemic, she just printed them at home. She used a stick-on laminate, much like I've used in the past when creating new labels for game cartridges and stuff like that. Although she did keep the original Heroid logo since it was kind of shiny silver logo and she didn't feel she could duplicate that. Mm. 
So about that remote control missing the battery door, unfortunately the door from the Omnibot almost fits, but not quite. You can see it sticks out way too far as the shape of the remote is slightly different. So she decided to mold her own battery door from this one using a similar technique from the tie rods earlier. However, partway through the process she added some extra clay to this part here. Now, the purpose of this is to add some extra plastic in the final mold, which will make sense shortly. Ok, so the mold is finished, now it's time to make the new part. And here it is. It just needs a little clean up of the edges, but um, here's where that extra plastic comes into play. Because the part is now thicker, this gives her the opportunity to cut some of the excess off so that it better fits the Heroid remote control. And after a little sanding, you can see it fits perfectly. Other than the color is slightly off, but I think we can overlook that. As for the corroded battery terminals, Randy has her own special sauce for that. <laughs> Actually, it's Louisiana hot sauce. She says it works well for removing corrosion. In fact, um, here are the finished terminals after soaking in the hot sauce. So there you go. Uh, now she can solder these back in place and reassemble the remote. And here is the finished product. It's not totally perfect. In fact, Randy and I discussed trying to polish the face dome, but neither of us have positive experiences trying to polish plastic, and we were afraid we'd make it worse. But uh, I think it's safe to say that overall it's much better shape than before. I think the thing I'm most impressed with was how well her tie rods came out. All four of these look as good as a factory piece. And of course the purpose behind these is to keep the bottom part of the arm horizontal when the shoulder part is moved like this. And they work perfectly. But yeah, even the finish on these feels like a factory part. I'm really impressed with that. The remote also came out pretty good, uh, even though it was never part of my original Heroid. Anyway, uh, let's power this thing on for a moment. And now let's just uh, take it for a little drive. <laughs> ok, so I never said it was fast. In fact, this thing is slow as molasses. I mean, you saw how many reduction gears it had, right? I thought I'd try playing a music cassette in here to see how it sounds. Although I don't think that's the primary purpose of the cassette deck. I'll put in the Planet X3 soundtrack. I can tell it has a lot of wow and flutter just by listening to it. The speaker sounds like a clock radio from the 80s. One neat thing is that the mouth lights up in sync with the music. Also, all of the controls on the tape deck are soft touch, which is kind of neat. One button I'm going to demonstrate on the remote is the talk button. This opens a voice channel from the remote to the robot. Kill all humans! Exterminate! <laughs> so, um... The way this thing actually works is you can actually move it around and when you push the buttons on here uh, most of the time it creates a tone, not dissimilar to a DTMF tone for example, and the tone is transmitted in the form of radio wave over to the Heroid and the Heroid um, can record these tones to the cassette tape. That way you're able to essentially record a set of actions for it to repeat. So it doesn't really have any modern day tracking mechanisms, like it really doesn't know where it is. Uh, you could, you know, program it to move throughout house uh, using a preset programming technique, but there's no guarantee it's going to make it through the second time because there may be different obstacles in the way or the traction on the wheels may not always be exactly the same or, or whatever. But it's still a pretty neat toy considering, you know, when it came out. Now it has two tracks on the tape, of course, because there's a left and right um, head just because it's a stereo cassette uh, deck. But um, when you're recording from the remote, one track is used for the tones that control the robot the other track is used to record your voice. So not only can it record you moving, but it records your voice as well. 
So again, a pretty neat toy. I'd love to do a little bit more demonstration on it, but um, this video has been in progress for about six weeks now, so I think it's time to wrap it up. Maybe in the next episode we'll cover it a little bit more in depth from a technical standpoint um, on how it works. But uh, for now, that's all. I'm gonna give this back to Randy because uh, I decided I don't have room for it. And Randy obviously loves collecting them. So this is her robot now. So hope she enjoys it. And uh, so that about wraps it up. So thanks for watching.